that it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome you all to the Von Hugel Lecture uh, for um, 2018. And I'm enormously honoured, it's a great privilege uh, for the museum that we have Professor John Mack on this occasion. Uh, John's work, I think, has been inspiring. It reflects, in many ways, what the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology is about. Um, over many decades, he has produced hugely important specialist studies in the arts of Africa, in the history of anthropology, in related areas. But he's also been a very imaginative generalist and written about small things, the sea, and a whole range of related fields. He uh, led the Museum of Mankind um, for a period marked by a series of very remarkable and innovative ex exhibitions that I think moved the curatorial endeavor in Britain forward in a very uh, important, enduringly important way. I think I would also just want to single out John's support, John's mentorship of African scholars and curators. If you go to uh, Nairobi, I think if you go to um, many African cities and museums, you encounter people who were trained by him or have been um, supported by him in, um, um, at various stages of their careers. Uh, he's been a, um, a great figure in our field and has supported initiatives, um, particularly in relation to African collections at, at the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. So I'm very much looking forward to what you have to say tonight. The title is um, Narrating and Curating the Ritual Object. Just before you speak, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I also wanted to um, mention that the Von Hugel Lecture is, is supported by the MAA Friends and particularly by Peter Chapman, the chair of the Friends. It's been a great initiative. Well, for um, uh, organising this event twice, uh, because uh, March didn't happen because of the uh, university lecturers' strike, uh, so we've, we've we've come into midsummer, so it's a little bit muggier than, than it had been. Um, I realise, in looking at the PowerPoint, that I've um, produced the version without captions, so I apologise for that. Um, but I'll provide any information as we go along that seems to be relevant. Um, I have problems, of course, with the idea of a ritual object, and so I'm certainly not going to end up uh, producing a, a definition which uh, is going to work in any wider sense. <clears throat> but I think there is something particular about uh, a certain class of objects, at least, um, which does certainly run over into other uh, kinds of areas. Uh, which is often described under a term such as agency these days, and, and uh, objects which have a certain inherent power. Uh, and what I want to address is the possibility of that being something which works uh, cross culturally. Um, let me start with um, von Hugo, um, because it seems to me that the centrality of the idea of ritual in humanities and social sciences is certainly one with which Baron Anatol von Hugel would have been entirely familiar, and not just from his um, studies in Fiji and elsewhere in the Pacific. Ritual and its analysis were part of the fabric of his devoutly Catholic family. He was, as we know, the first director of the Museum of Archaeology here in Cambridge in 1884, but was also president of the University's Catholic Association, of which, indeed, he was also the founder. It was he who organized the petition which led to Catholics being admitted to Cambridge in uh, the late 1890s, mid-1890s. His elder brother, Baron Friedrich, was also a prominent Catholic, a Catholic writer, 
the author of a number of theological works, of which his two volumes on the mystical element of religion is perhaps the most uh, influential published in 1908. Friedrich's range of correspondence was large and international. He sometimes linked, albeit somewhat indirectly, with the uh, group sometimes referred to as the ritualists or the myth ritualists, so a loose grouping of, of anthropologists, classicists, uh, theologians, and others, mostly Cambridge-based, uh, whose, whose common objective was the exploration of the overlaps between mythic narratives and ritual practice. Um, expanded from an origin in Semitic studies, uh, to encompass non-European cultures. They were influenced by the thinking of the obvious candidates, James Fraser, uh, Emil Durkheim, and so forth. Amongst those identified with this intellectual trend were A.M. Hocart, Lord Raglan, Jane Harrison, Gilbert Murray, and others well known from the early, uh, early half of the century. The guiding proposition was that myth provides a script which ritual makes explicit. The weather myth explains ritual, or ritual enacts myth, is a, a chicken and egg question which added nuance and points of debate to the emerging discourse. Neither of the barons von Hugel would be counted as more than tangential figures within this movement of thought, but both brothers would certainly have been aware of the developing strand of this uh, period in the early 20th century uh, in uh, intellectual history. In conformity with the evolutionary language of his era, Baron Friedrich wrote of the different approaches to mysticism which could be encountered in what he called the primitive, naive type of religion. For Baron Anatol, the developing collections of the MAA provided innumerable objects as material evidence of ritual outside, uh, around the world. But outside of the museum context, the kinds of objects which might be considered as ritual, in some sense, often receive a scant attention in the uh, myth ritualist texts. And despite the innumerable studies of ritual as a theme and of specific examples from cultures around the world, the same might be said of many of the leading uh, uh, theoreticians of ritual practice. As but one example, Victor Turner, himself interestingly a Catholic convert, and one of the most influential theorists of uh, ritual practice in the second half of the 20th century, published extensively on the ritual and uh, ritual structure, on the structure and characteristics of rites of passage in particular. He developed the idea of liminality from older sources. Uh, he explored the concept of communitas and the notion of anti-structure to characterize the ritual process. Turner worked originally amongst the Ndambu peoples in Zambia, where masquerade, for example, is a significant part of the initiation of boys into adulthood and elders into and ancestors. Yet he made very little of the role of masks or any other objects that we used uh, in his, uh, in his uh, wider uh, uh, writings um, on the, the role of objects in ritual. Uh, all we can find are scattered remarks <coughs> on what he talks of as a taste for the grotesque. The idea of the grotesque clearly implies some sense of a lack of care, a lack of discipline, in the production of objects. So whether the term grotesque is the right one for this phenomenon, the everyday is nonetheless uh, <coughs> often materially altered as familiar objects are rendered at a different scale from the usual. He writes, a head, nose, or phallus, a hoe, bow, or meal mortar are represented as huge or tiny by comparison with other features of their context which retain their normal size. Likewise, the appearance of objects may be changed through the way they are painted. Sometimes things retain their customary shapes, he notes, but are, are, are portrayed in unusual colors. For Turner, the primary effect of these transpositions of scale and surface is that it turns the everyday uh, into an object of reflection. The emphasis is less on the object actually doing anything uh, than as an adjunct to their capacity to pr provoke thought. As objects, they therefore lack not just discipline, but narrative, the kind of narrative that an earlier generation myth was held to provide for ritual performance itself. 
In terms of achieving out an outcome, they are, in his analysis, props rather than agents. And in that light, it is easy to see how they might slip beneath the radar. But so-called ritual objects are slippery in another way. Turner isn't suggesting that their appearance in rites of passage and the like is in any way prescriptive. Indeed, he goes on to argue that they are not objects with a singular fixed meaning. They're multivocal rather than univocal, a semantic molecule, he writes, with uh, many components. Their lack of a clear purpose is the point. They aren't functional objects, other than the, in the elusive sense of being objects appropriate to periods of liminality when time is out of joint and objects themselves are rendered in unfamiliar formats. But what, however, is a ritual object? Indeed, is the term of much or any analytical use. From what's been said, it's apparent that without a, a documented context, pretty much everything is up for grabs. One argument might be that because they aren't evidence in the way that functional objects are, they escape explicit definition. And if that is so, the objects aren't going to tell us very much about the nature of the societies that produce them in the way that functional objects might, unless, that is, we know a great deal more about them. So as archaeologists often find, they assume a status that potentially approaches one of redundancy. Ritual objects can become the default faculty category for something without assignable purpose. This looks weird, it must be ritual. <clears throat> In catalogues and museum registers, it can often be taken to mean simply that there is no narrative that can be offered. However, that said, such objects can have an imaginative potency even so. The gaps in narrative open up innumerable uh, opportunities for multiple readings. And museums which hold and display such objects are primary sites where things which otherwise escape ready explanation attract alternative interpretations. So let me start with a, a short and somewhat idiosyncratic example, but one which introduces a range of themes relevant to uh, this evening. At the Museum of Mankind, where as Nick said I, I worked from the mid-1970s onwards, became well known for a particular kind of what might be called monographic exhibition. These were exhibitions which often took a single culture and explored it by invoking the physical circumstances in which the objects in the museum collections, the ethnographic collections of the British Museum, were originally seen. Often they would be based on fieldwork undertaken overseas by curators or other collaborators, usually anthropologists, who might have documented the cultures in which they worked through making contemporary collections with supporting documentation, photography, and, and sometimes film. They were all about context, the physical and cultural context in which objects might be say, seen when in situ, whether that's a, a, Middle, Eastern, a Middle Eastern soup, Middle Eastern soup, a village in Madagascar, as here, uh, an exhibition I did, a reconstructed Ashanti court in Ghana, uh, an Indonesian rice barn, and so on and so forth. Whatever may be thought about them now, about the assumption that could easily creep in of objects and cultures existing in a, a kind of timeless present, uh, or indeed um, the oddity of, of having uh, simulacra of uh, apparently materially impoverished communities right in the heart of Mayfair in London, they were, for all that, undoubtedly popular. There was, in fact, a moment in the 1990s when the government introduced um, charging surge, uh, uh, charges in uh, national museums, uh, and the Museum of Mankind happily escaped that. So there was a moment when I was looking forward to going to the trustees and telling them that at approaching 500,000 visitors a year, we actually had just surpassed the attendance figures for the Victorian Art Museum, but that didn't quite happen. <laughs> As an offshoot of the British Museum, one gallery retained the characteristics of a more conventional agenda, the grand room at the top of a kind of Fred Astaire and, and Ginger Rogers kind of staircase, uh, and the room was termed unashamedly the treasure's room. And here the star of the show was the crystal skull, thought at the time to be of ancient Mexican, possibly Aztec origin. It wasn't unusual 
for us to get requests to photograph the skull with particular lighting angles to reveal its secrets in the plains beneath. Sometimes visitors would be accommodated wanting to chant or pray in front of it. Some of the warning staff reported witnessing the skull moving quietly around in its box-like glass case. And every night when the museum closed its doors to the public, a black velvet cloth came out, and this was carefully put over the top of the case, ostensibly to keep the dust from settling there, but I'm afraid I always thought of a bunch of regards being put to sleep rather than dust the same. <coughs> there are many, um, <coughs> there are in fact as many as 13 similar life-size skulls, if, if life-size is the right term for the skull reproduced in this way, um, in museums in London, Paris, Washington, D.C., and in private hands. The material, the crystal itself, isn't in fact from Mexico, but is now known to be possibly from Brazil, or even maybe from Madagascar, which from my own work that I happen to know is uh, a place much scouted by clairvoyants to get the materials for crystal balls in the UK. And the marks identified on the skull under a microscope show that they were made with the kinds of tools that jewellers and dentists might use, appropriate actually, since the British Museum example, this example, was acquired in 1897 from Tiffany's in New York. Further research since has shown a link of at least some of the skulls to a French, French antiquarian, Eugène Bobin, who was an official archaeologist at the court of Maximilian I in Mexico. So it's definitely not pre-Columbian in origin, as the label that accompanies uh, the uh, current display in the Welcome Gallery of the British Museum acknowledges. Indeed, the British Museum website also declares the British Museum views the skull in its collections as an enigmatic object of great interest but with no supernatural properties. Nonetheless, the BM skull and the other 12 that are known retain a powerful place in the popular imaginary. In uh, 2018, uh, sorry, 2008, Indiana Jones got caught up in a complex plot involving Russian agents and at least one crystal skull left by a mysterious alien culture in Peru and possessed, possessed of great psychic power, now not like reportedly uh, Aztec, but Inca related. Well, should all this matter, if the diligent curator spent patient hours in the archives checking his or her facts, uh, writing the definitive caption uh, and catalogue, what are we to make of the proliferation of alternative readings deriving from less objective and verifiable understandings of the significance and meaning of an object that arise when other, uh, others encounter the same object, perhaps, in the, in the museum display? And if that eventuates, not in some narrative take on what they see before them, at least to the enactment of ritual in front of an object, how is that to be accommodated? The makers of exhibitions are no doubt all familiar with the critical response which takes issue with something in the display, whether that something uh, wasn't uh, something they intended to be there in the first place, or is only a very small part of a much larger display such that it, it reads like a self-regarding expression of approaches and attitudes that have little to do with the curatorial interpretation on offer. And I doubt we've all had similar experiences in reading reviews of our own books in journals and newspapers. The um, philosopher theologian Paul Ricoeur had interesting things to say about Freudian psychoanalytic practice but the real insights come not from considering the experience of the patient in and of itself, but from paying attention to the language and the narrative through which experience is recounted on the psychoanalyst's couch. Is it the role of the contemporary curator to suspend disbelief in some paternalistic manner and engage with experience even where it involves accommodating activities and practice which seem at odds with what they otherwise think or know to be true. And I suppose with um, the equinox coming up, English heritage at uh, Stonehenge will be facing similar sorts of thought. So here are a number of strands to be addressed. For present purposes, I'm actually less interested in my initial example in the provenance of the skulls than in the narratives and practices which have arisen around them amongst uh, curators, uh, 
visitors and the like. As with many of the objects referred to somewhat loosely as ritual, we know rather little about them. In museums, such objects are out of context, yet they're still attributed an inherent power, and out in part as a result of their obscurity. This has implications which are at once didactic and ethical. What is said about such objects and how they are treated and displayed, such objects attain what may be called a kind of personhood in function of the behaviours which they elicit and the setting in which they are encountered, whether this is a, a shrine, a church, or a museum. And indeed, they can also be encountered uh, in a domestic setting, even um, a, uh, a fireplace here in a sitting room. Um, the caption to this reads, in case you can see it, Professor Caswell tells me this damn thing happens to be a Ubangi symbol of fertility. <laughs> what the cartoon cartoonist has in mind would seem to be what in African-American slang is known as a, a mojo, as in the great Muddy Waters blues classic, I got my mojo working, but it won't, just won't work on you. Or the phrase in English for someone who's lost their attraction, they've lost their mojo. And the term derives, I think, from a Kikongo word, meaning a child or talisman, a, 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 a sort of equatorial African version of the West African term juju. So that leads us towards a set of well-known figures from the lower Congo, which are created and operated for a wide range of purposes, including that of changing someone's fortune. The object in the drawing is, in fact, identifiably of a kind found uh, in Mali, amongst the Yamana peoples in West Africa, where it represents or replaces uh, a deceased twin. So the image in the cartoon isn't some kind of fertility-inducing charm. And it's not from the, from the Ubangi, which is actually a region in the equatorial forests of the upper Congo, not the lower Congo. But there are other objects which might have been chosen, uh, which would have been appropriate uh, to the situation the cartoon sets, sets to satirize. The, cartoonist, uh, the cartoon, of course, is set in mid-20th century America. The implication clearly is that the object from uh, this object from Africa still works regardless of, of culture and location. Indeed, a number of lower Congo figures were offered to the British Museum in my time by donors who encountered uh, a run of serious misfortune and speculated that if they could only get rid of the object, their fortunes would look up. They wanted rid of them as quickly as possible. In another example, I once visited a, an eminent, in fact, a royal academician, an eminent painter, at his house in a part of South London prone to burglary, and he'd not suffered the same fate as his neighbours, having protected himself against it by a simple and striking security measure. Inside the hall, and directly facing the letterbox, he had installed a version of a Congo nail figure. This, in fact, isn't his example, but I didn't hang around to take the photograph, so this is Paul uh, Bjorn's uh, study, which also has a similar figure in it. The figure the artist reassuringly felt would be interpreted by any potential intruder as possessing an inherent capacity for exacting retribution on anyone who looked through the letterbox and indeed knocked his front door down. In fact, he confected the object himself, but that didn't diminish the impact he expected it to have. Known generically as in PC, though with particular names for particular types, such figures are a prime example of an object which has resonance cross-culturally and which have been extensively discussed and debated. So let me explore this example as my main case study and look at a range of narratives these Congo figures have attracted, both from scholars, curators, uh, and others, especially artists influenced by them and adding other levels of interpretation. Uh, the objects themselves come from this part of Equatorial Africa, covered these days by Angola, the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, Cabinda, and uh, the Republic of Congo. As, as you can see, the equator runs through here, so many of the objects come from any of these um, different countries. Um, the objects in question have some notoriety because in the latter part of the 19th century, they were widely regarded as prime examples of what E.B. Tyler had discussed as fetishes, a term which gained increasing currency through the latter part of the 19th century and found its way into 
the vocabulary of, of Marxists, of psychoanalysts, art historians, of historians of colonization, and so forth. For Tyler, fetishism was a development of ideas uh, of animism. In his words, it is the doctrine of spirits embedded in or attached to or conveying influence through certain material objects. And from there, by short steps, we end up with attention less focused on the agency of the object and more on the kind of language associated with ideas of worship, so it emerges as a form of idolatry. The kind of thinking uh, that is perhaps implicit in this Victorian picture uh, by an East Anglian-born watercolorist, Thomas Baines, of an imagined scene at the mouth of the River Congo, when a so-called African war fetish, which is the title of the painting, was, we are told, taken uh, in the 1860s by the crew of HMS uh, Archer. Baines would be better known to many as someone who worked extensively in Southern Africa, uh, and uh, indeed went with Livingston exploring the, the Zambezi. The painting uh, and the figure itself are both, the, the figure in the, in the painting, are both now in the Royal Geographical Society. It is not a war, a war fetish. Um, it is, in fact, an object of, of, of a different sort altogether. But the positioning and articulation of the figures in the picture strongly evokes this European narrative of a, a confrontation with what was regarded as arcane barbarity. And Congo and Kisi were the epitome of this particular trope, invoked in unlikely contexts and like, linked to other phenomena well beyond the Congolese world. This, I might say, is uh, one of the only examples I'm aware of where an Nkisi, it is said, was taken uh, explicitly as loot. Nkisi go out in and out of favor, and if they cease to be effective, uh, that they, um, that they get disposed of, and many were indeed collected by uh, missionaries who used them to raise funds for mission activities. The narrative being that the objects were testament to heathen practices. So there aren't any repatriation objects or issues around Congo figures, as far as I'm aware, um, as there are in other well-known cases. And Kisi figures and Condi, as they're known, um, such as the one in the picture here, male figures, provoked the most disparaging of comment, even being drawn into a war of worlds by opposing sides in the First World War. Um, on uh, your left here, um, you uh, see uh, a statue um, put up outside the Reichstag in September, in Berlin, in September uh, 1915. Uh, it was inaugurated by Princess August Wilhelm. It's massive, 42 foot high, and it's of the German hero, uh, Field Marshal Paul von Hindenburg. To conclude the dedication, um, Princess uh, Wilhelm uh, crossed the platform and drove a gold nail, we are told, into his name on the base of the statue. And over the next five hours, members of the public covered the lower part of the figure leading over the coming months to the erection of uh, scaffolding such as this to allow access by visitors higher up the figure. Uh, we are told that about 20,000 nails were driven into the object in the first, in the first day alone uh, uh, when it became available to the public. The overt purpose of this heroic sculpture and these acts was to raise money for the war effort. Similar figures, in fact, were being erected all over Germany, with the nails acquired at different prices for iron, silver, and gold, but each, in effect, recording a donation. What was different about the Berlin so-called Man of Iron uh, was that it was dedicated to a living military figure. Hindenburg had, in fact, led the German troops in the successful Battle of Tannenberg against the Russians the year before, in 1914. And also, it's different in that the nailing wasn't limited to the plinth that escalated uh, right up the, the figure itself. Nailing a wooden figure was a means of converting it into a different kind of entity, a man of iron, after the image of Bismarck, the Iron Chancellor. However, this was baffling to some, 
and inevitable comparisons with Congolese practices of nailing figures began to surface in the German press. In Britain, of course, um, it was a gift from publicity points of view. So in Britain, um, the Hindenburg was openly lampooned, as in this picture taken outside a hospital in <coughs> Stepney in East London of uh, nurses climbing up a Harrods ladder, obscurely, in order to nail not the lower part of the figure, but the head um, uh, of the figure uh, uh, in, in what's clearly um, an act of violating the, um, the figure, which was not the case in Germany. The Illustrated London News was quite explicit in its drawing out of the implications, making visual comparisons between what was happening in Berlin and along the Atlantic coast of equatorial Africa. A pam an official pamphlet issued in Britain at the time invoked racial stereotypes, reversing common German tropes in the, uh, the Great War. It reads, astonished by these analogies and the cult of nailed idols between the peoples of black savages and those of white savages, learned men think that everything points to a common origin the Germans are white Negroes. But whatever its success in raising funds for the war effort in Germany, the Hindenburg Monument was a publicity disaster elsewhere. In fact, the ideas of nailing wood objects to mark boundaries was a medieval practice in some parts of, of Europe. So the idea that all this was a mark of the primitive was barely challenged. In Germany, sculptors of other heroic images made the point that their works were raised up on tall plinths. The nailing that uh, was to become common in German cities was limited and didn't spread up uh, the uh, figure as, as, as with the Anne Hindenburg. What the Hindenburg uh, image shared with Congo and Kisi was that its status as art was impaired. It couldn't be art in the early 20th century terms because the distance between the object and the viewer had been violated. The fetish in these terms characteristically fused subject and object, collapsing expectations of aesthetic difference. That, after all, is also the basis of uh, psychoanalytic understandings of fetishistic practice. The idea of the fetish, then, lies well over a century of uh, lies well over a century, flattered uh, over a century, of systematic misunderstanding of Congo and Kisi in Europe. More recently, there's been a great deal of anthropological, historical, and art historical investigation. And there are also indigenous accounts, most written in Congo and available in translation and study most effectively by White McGaffey, who also, I think, spent time here at Cambridge a decade or so ago. Um, from these accounts, fuller understandings can be brought together. The object becomes, in the hands of a ritual specialist, a habitation of a spirit, usually a spirit of the dead. Metaphorically or metonymically, the materials used enable this connection. The earth used uh, is that from the grave site, um, the mirrors, uh, uh, or, or the white ceramics of the eyes, both reference boundaries, they're reflective, reflective surfaces, if you like, invoke the idea of the sea or of the surface of a river over which the dead are said to pass on their way to the other world. And the whiteness also recalls the color change the dead themselves go through. White McGaffey, in fact, has a, a wonderful um, anecdote about being in a market in Kikonga, in Congo territory, and overhearing people talking behind him and saying, you see that white guy over there? He's one of the dead who's come back, meaning, of course, that he was potentially a slave that had been sent to the United States uh, and had returned to Kikongo because he spoke Kikongo, a new Kikongo culture. Other materials reference sayings or proverbs. There's a great deal more, however, that could be said than we have time for here. They're used in a whole variety of contexts healing, the cultivation of good fortune, or better fortune certainly, to identify witches and to fix uh, a vow or conclude a treaty. So here I want to draw out two features. 
In brief, individual and Kisi are owned by specialist operators, and each object has an individual name, a known area of expertise, and often an appropriate reputation for the success of its interventions. In Kisi come in a variety of forms and types, but each is conceived as containing an inherent power deriving from the medicines applied to it. Whether their cause is medical, some other personal matter, or the swearing of an oath, the method of making supplication to a Kisi is for the client to attach some element of their own personhood to the object. This may be a small piece of cloth from their clothing, or spittle, or sweat, often rubbed onto a nail which is driven into the object. A switch is thereby effected, and in mechanical terms, the supplicant is rendered submissive to the insights and diagnoses of the object that it's operated. In effect, the object is personified, and in the process, the person becomes objectified. To put it another way, in relation to the personified object, the person becomes the client, or in more directly medical vocabulary, the patient. This is uh, my take, my simplified version of a much more complicated analysis which Alfred Gell proposes in his influential book, Art and Agency. So what the object represents, inverted commas, is a set of retributive powers, and not a personality which in any sense looks like the object itself. So we're not sticking pins and dolls and that kind of thing. Indeed, they don't have to be anthropomorphic at all to be effective. Uh, these are some figures from uh, the, some objects from famous collection, the Denning collection in Exeter, which has just reopened last month to, the, the gallery has just reopened that last month to the, uh, to the public. And as you can see, in Kisi can be shells, they can be baskets, they can be pothorn, pothorn pots and horns and so forth. They're better thought of, in effect, as containers. Ngisi were seen as variously scarecrows, as indecent, as frankly obscene by 19th century authors, those are all quotes. The second point is that where the idea of the fetish is often presented in these terms as irrational, what Gell and others have shown convincingly is that they are in fact powerful because they're an accumulation of relevant materials. And far from being random, their power resides entirely in the, the appropriateness of the elements of which they're composed. But they're also open to innovation. McGaffey uses the uh, word astonishment to describe the most powerful object of, of these objects which innovate in terms of their assemblage, but in ways which that participants in ritual are very well aware of. I can illustrate this, I think, with one very quick example. There are a series of diagrams which have appeared in texts about Congo thought and which fit well with the use of mirrors and white ceramics on the Kisi. The Congo are said in early mission texts to have explained their cosmology through a series of ideograms. One is the cross and the other is a circle with a line across the middle of it. It's explained that the world of the living and of the dead are parallel worlds, such that when the sun rises in the human sphere, it sets in the abode of the dead, and vice versa. One is the opposite of the other. And when it sinks over the horizon, that surface demarcates the division of the two worlds. As we've seen, a shiny surface can indicate the surface of water, beyond which is the unseen world of the living. A circle can be used diagrammatically. Uh, oops, text, never mind. Uh, can be used um, di diagrammatically um, to, to explain all of this. But a uh, student of ours uh, has just recently been working with Nganga in the Republic of Congo, and there, uh, indeed, the circle is used. But uh, the interesting thing is that it's no longer a line through the middle, but it's become this much more complex uh, ideogram. And what, in fact, has happened is that um, uh, Freemasonry has arrived in the Republic of Congo and has been adapted in order to uh, uh, work its way into um, uh, the, the understandings, as it were. So my argument is that um, the use of, of crosses and so forth, which historically 
has always been said to precede the arrival of Christianity and to represent, therefore, uh, Congo cosmology, that actually it may not, that may not be the case. It may actually be that it is being picked up and used in order to explain something because it is an opposite image, uh, just as these are. Well, all of this has led to the development of um, a whole series of recent exhibitions on Congo culture specifically. Uh, two very recent ones, one Congo Across the Waters, which was in uh, Gainesville, I think, in Florida. Uh, across the Waters meaning it's about both uh, uh, collections from the Congo itself, but also uh, from African-American sources. And as you see, there's no problem here about putting a major figure right in the, um, as the first object you see. Similarly, uh, Congo Power and Majesty was a recent exhibition at uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And again, you can see the objects here that are being isolated in this way. They're being treated as art objects. Uh, they've escaped um, uh, the, uh, the fetish um, uh, attribution uh, and are now being considered directly in their own terms. You'll see here the narrative is limited. There isn't particularly a narrative in this exhibition. There's no labeling here that's, that's uh, discussing it in that sort of detail. Um, however, um, there are other ways in which that can happen. And I, I think the way in which exhibitions are often treated as unique unto themselves ignores the fact that the catalogue or the outreach activities and everything else are actually part of the same total package and make up, as it were, the larger narrative um, around an exhibition. So here the catalogue and so forth are important, but the term power and majesty, an earlier exhibition at the Smithsonian was called Astonishment and Power. So we're having now a, a different vocabulary um, being used on them. And there are very fine examples of Congo objects, and I don't think we've got one here, um, maybe I'm wrong, uh, but you certainly find them in the Rivers British Museum, uh, Exeter, um, Man Manchester, in London, not just the British Museum, the Royal Geographical Society, as I mentioned before, the Welcome Collection. Uh, and the Science Museum uh, had one on display, and they're redoing the galleries, so I imagine it'll come back when they reopen. So they are now um, being treated uh, as significant objects in their own right. Another image of uh, the, the Met exhibition. But moving on from there, um, it's also the case that a number of artists have begun to pick up on these objects. Uh, these are two pieces by Grayson Perry from the exhibition he did uh, at the British Museum called The Tomb of the Unknown Craftsman. Um, and uh, the one nearest me uh, seems to me to be quite clearly based on a Congo figure that it has perhaps an Ethiopian cross being held up as well. But the, I think the point of it is that it's a, it's a sort of tribute to uh, motherhood, to the encumberment of, of motherhood. That seems to be uh, what, what he's discussing there. The one on the far side he calls the king of nowhere, and that would seem to reflect back to this uh, earlier um, awkward history of Congo figures, but clearly based upon, upon that. Then um, there's the so-called Chapman family collection, which is a collection of objects uh, made by the Chapman brothers themselves, but um, uh, imitating so-called ethnographical objects, mostly from Africa, in this case, the ones you can see all are. Um, this is slightly different. I, I, in reading a review of this, uh, by uh, one, in one of the main newspapers, um, <laughs> rather oddly, the person went right through and towards the end of the um, uh, review said, and then I came across a Cameroonian figure eating a McDonald's. Well, why on earth the person hadn't realized what was going on in the first place, I don't know. But it did lead to rather an interesting observation, which is that essentially the way in which one might think about this collection is in terms of 
the fetishism of materials, that Marxist idea, uh, which this would seem to be partly about. Uh, and here again we get uh, clearly Congo figures, the one on the far side with nails, the one, uh, sorry, this one, and the one on the far side, uh, a double-headed dog figure, which is a, a form of Nkisi because it uh, reflects the ability of a dog to find its way in, in, in the forest, uh, and also because it's able to look in two directions so it can uh, see both the world of the living and of the dead. So there are ways of thinking about it, but uh, they're clearly uh, uh, taking a different tack. Then I think there are uh, African-American artists and others who uh, are making a great deal more of uh, these objects than uh, their British counterparts. These are works by an American, African-American artist called René Stout, quite well known. Um, the one on the far side is literally called Fetish Number no. 2 and is in Dallas Museum. Um, and it incorporates um, elements of her own hair, uh, fingernails, and so forth. So it is, in many ways, uh, she is making her own figure in the image of, um, of, of Nkisi and finding out about them by asking elderly relatives, I think she comes from the Mississippi Delta area, where there are um, uh, funerary sites, African American funerary sites, contain, containing so-called memory uh, bottles or boxes, containers that have all sorts of, of uh, objects materials in them which have particular significance and importance. So she's working those now into artworks. But I think one of the most interesting in a way is a Brazilian, uh, French Brazilian artist, Alexis Peskin, who had an exhibition last year at the um, uh, October Gallery in London, uh, as you see, called Par Figures. And what these are are portraits, mostly of uh, West African uh, subjects, made with nails, and uh, this is what he does. So he drives nails into a wooden uh, former, uh, and does it in this extraordinary way, whereby both the size of the head, the depth to which it's hammered in, uh, the extent to which it's eroded on the top, and so forth, actually allow him to create very, very uh, successful portraits. And this seems to me to, um, comply very closely with Gerald's observation that um, an artist is basically someone who's producing works that even if you tried, you know you couldn't uh, achieve it. It is indeed astonishing, uh, as they were saying. And finally, um, this work by uh, a Congolese artist, uh, Trudeau Pula, which is called Tatene, your television, uh, produced for the uh, Museum for African Art in New York in and I think it's very interestingly conceived. The mirror, uh, typical of Nkisi, as you see, is presented as a screen onto which the viewers project their aspirations and longings. The viewers are Congolese, and of course Nkisi do embody a part of transform individual lives. So there's actually quite a lot of understanding uh, built into this. But ironically, of course, um, as we look at the image on the screen here, we too are conscious of the kinds of projection that we make in relation to an object in the display case. Well, museums for many years, especially museums of anthropological holdings, have been entirely familiar with facilitating access to collections from originating communities, and often that involves making arrangements for ritual process to take place. The ecclesiastical objects in the basement of the British Museum, for instance, to which the priest in charge of the Ethiopian church in London has access, is a case in point. Um, perhaps I have time to go into that in detail, but I, I can discuss it afterwards. It is one answer, actually, one interesting way of thinking about the um, uh, repatriation issue. Exhibitions, not infrequently, are opened not just with European etiquette in regard to such events, but dawn ceremonies in the case of Maori displays, libations, and so forth, in the case of other exhibitions, are all um, common. This participatory aspect is something that artists and curators 
are now routinely encouraging. An instance is the work of the German conceptual artists Jochen Goetz and Esther Shalev Goetz, which has striking similarity to the Hindenburg monument, and coincidentally to some aspects of the use of Nkisi. Most monuments are in praise of something or someone or some event, uh, or as some kind of act of remembrance. This is the revert, this is the revert, sorry, it, uh, this is the reverse of that. It's a monument which uh, was commissioned against something, against the rise of fascism in Hamburg in the late 1970s. And what happened was that the Goetzes uh, were uh, invited to uh, create an artwork uh, and this is the result. It's a, a tall pillar, um, which again one thinks back to the Hindenburg. Um, the, uh, there is a text that goes with it, which says, "We invite the citizens of Harburg, Harburg being part of Hamburg, to add their names to ours. In doing so, we commit ourselves to remain vigilant, as more and more names cover this 12-meter-high column. It would be lowered into the ground." One day it will have disappeared completely, and the site of the Harburg Monument against fascism will be empty. In the long run, it is only we ourselves who can stand up against injustice. Well, after seven years, it had disappeared uh, into the ground, and all that remained was the uh, text uh, above. And what had involved building scaffolding in Berlin to climb up the monument, here involved the gradual descent of the monument itself into the ground in a kind of collective act of burying something painful. Narrative seems to have become the common way in a postmodern context in which the academies and museums interact with their audiences. Neil McGregor much praised history of the world and a hundred objects in his subsequent Living with God are good examples. These aren't Churchillian histories setting out to integrate global developments across a vast timeline, landscapes and seascapes, though their titles might suggest that. In fact, they aren't histories at all in terms of any structured chronological linkage. They don't insist on any overarching vision, but they do raise questions which, if positively posed, do encourage reflection on the part of the viewer, reader, or uh, in case of the 100 objects, uh, the radio listener. In museological terms, and of course McGregor's contributions in two British Museum uh, exhibitions, they are an antidote to that older tradition which puts the curator in pole position at the expense of the visitor, text and label of a visual excitement, didactic knowledge of the stimulation and inspiration. Read this and you're licensed to look at that, they sometimes seem to imply. A more recent approach re-engages with an older Enlightenment conception of seeing museum collections as sources of curiosity, as explored by Nick Thomas in his recent book. But some historians have deplored the tendency in research projects to seek to learn more and more about less and less. This approach returns us to the object itself, but explores it not for its specificity, but for the aspiration to open up a wider moral and cultural understanding. If I have just a few minutes left, let me finish with one last reflection. It concerns another act of commemoration and an attempt to create what in loose terms might also be thought of as a ritual object. In 2003, the British Museum was 250 years old, so how to celebrate this event? This was already, and there was already an institutional history uh, published by a former director David Wilson just a, a year or so before, so the exhibition had to be something else than a book on the wall. And since it fell to me uh, to come up with something, the decision uh, was made to look at the British Museum not as a site of history, but of memory, and a selection was made from across the museum's collections uh, around various aspects of that theme. However, it was also a birthday of 250 years, so a cake was in order. And the centre piece of the exhibition, so just a few shots of the kinds of range of things that were in it. Oh, sorry, that's Ethiopia. Oh, great. 
got very confused here, sorry. There we are. Um, that's what happened to the deal with Rachel, then it becomes complicated. So um, a decision was made to commission a, um, a version of, uh, if you like, of a, of a birthday cake. Uh, this is the maker, or these are the makers. Eugenio uh, Reyes, who's a uh, Mexican altar maker, uh, and his assistant at the British Museum and Carpenter. Uh, so he's used to making Day of the Dead memorials. Um, the commission, uh, as we uh, expressed it to him, was quite simple to do what he normally does, um, to have as the base of it the portico of the British Museum with its columns, um, and to have in the centre of the ancestor, um, now I've once for Hans Sloan, the founder of the British Museum. Well, I happen to have been brought up on a small farm quite near where the, the small town in Ireland where um, uh, Hans Sloan was also from, and it is a Protestant, strongly Protestant part of uh, Northern Ireland. So I was conscious of the difficulty of commemorating Sir Hans Sloan, 250 years old, by placing him in the middle of a vast Catholic shrine. <laughs> so, unbeknown to me, what actually happened, and this was not part of the commission, was that Eugenio Reyes went out on the last day and bought some orange crepe paper and scattered it all over the base of the... <laughs> Uh, the shrine, making it into one of the most ecumenical of the shrines. And I thank him for that. Thank you. John, thank you so much for completely absorbing talk. About halfway through, as you were interrogating the category of the ritual object, I was reminded of. Anthony Forge, having written um, 45 years ago, I think that he encountered many, many ancestor figures in collections from New Guinea, and he doubted that most of these pieces, in fact, represented ancestors. I was reminded as well that one of the best known objects in the museum is difficult to write the label for because we don't know what it is. Um, and I think what you point to is that one of the issues you point to is um, the very problematic nature of these terms and labels that we use in so many contexts routinely in, in museum work, um, but also to the sheer importance of serious, dedicated ethnographic and historical work in trying to tease out what a ritual object and categories of that kind um, could possibly um, mean. Um, I found that discussion extraordinarily illuminating and I also thought it was hugely um, important that um, you drew attention to the work of, of contemporary artists who, as it were, are, are co-interpreters, um, people who help us enormously in um, thinking through those issues. Thank you again so much for a really um, inspiring talk. I would like to invite everybody to walk across to the museum um, where we'll have drinks and a chance to talk to these talk to these issues further with you. Thanks very much.